Hello, today we are just going to briefly kind of go over, brush over all of the equations for the physics section. Um, a lot of these are kind of nitty gritty in detail, but this is everything that could be mentioned. Um, we'll kind of talk about which ones are the most important here, but let's just get a good grip of everything that's going on here. I know it's a lot. Um, so first we start off here with kinematics. Now these are the big five kinematics equations that you're going to need to know. And the way that I memorize them is that each one is missing something. So when you write out all your variables, initial velocity, final velocity, distance, time, acceleration, each one of these equations is not going to have one of these. So usually when you're solving an equation, you won't have one of these given and you're trying to solve for one of these. So you're only going to have three. So you need to be able to just to decipher which one of these equations you're gonna use. So these are very helpful to memorize. Next, if we go down to projectile motion, this has to do with displacement and velocity of horizontal and vertical um, projectile motion. This is helpful to know if you're not comfortable with physics, but if you know the big five up here equations really well, this is what these reduce to. And I wrote here off to the side, it's the same as like no V equation or same as no D equation. So moving on, and then these velocity, cosine, sine, again, you don't need to memorize these because if you know how to draw your free body diagram, it'll show it to you for itself, but this is also just helpful to know. So that was kinematics. Now we're gonna move down to mechanics. And this is gonna be everything like gravitational force, atoms, momentum, centripetal acceleration, stuff like that. So these are the first three laws. First law is basically saying that an object at rest will stay at rest unless it's acted upon by like an outside source, which is basically saying that F net is zero when velocity is constant. Second law, F equals MA. Third law is equal and opposite reactions. Um, we move down to gravitational force, GMM over R squared. We have friction, kinetic, and static. Um, static friction, the coefficient mu s is always going to be greater than mu k. Center of mass, and then all of the centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. Important to know. Centripetal force, you don't need to memorize. If you know that it, centripetal acceleration is v squared over r, you can use f equals ma. Just a is um, substituted for the centripetal acceleration. Torque equals the length times the force times the angle at which it meets. Work, FD cosine theta. Power, work over time. Um, again, with the second power one, you don't need to know power equals force times velocity if you know how to derive it. So power equals work over time. We know that work is force times displacement. So power equals FD over T. And we know that distance over time is velocity. So power equals force times velocity. That's how you get there. Kinetic energy, work, kinetic energy theorem. That one is important. Gravitational potential energy, also very important. How those energies fit in with work is going to be an important concept to know. Um, conservation of energy, total mechanical energy, work with conservative forces. I don't think these are as high yield. Efficiency, work, mechanical advantage. Normally a lot of these kind of nitty gritty equations down here they'll give you in the passage. So not as high yield, but if you've taken physics classes before, these might just click um, and be memorized easy. So thermodynamics now, this is the temperature for a monoatomic gas. Um, this is basically saying kinetic energy is three over two kBT. Um, thermal expansion, first law of thermodynamics, pressure volume work relationship work is pressure times change in volume. That's for gases instead of for mechanics as we did earlier. I don't think these down here, these heat ones are very high yield, but good to know if you have a really physics heavy section. Fluids, density, obviously mass over volume, specific gravity is just the relationship of the density over the density of water pressure, force over area. Now all of these gauge pressures are kind of self-explanatory. It's saying that the pressure of the gauge is the density of the fluid times gravity times distance. Um, and so the gauge pressure would be due to the fluid only. And then if you want the total pressure, you'd have to add the atmospheric pressure on top of that. Um, and then the total would be the pressure at the surface time plus the pressure at the gauge for a closed container. So it's just talking about that relationship there. Buoyancy, rho vg. Um, with buoyancy, it's important to remember that 
the volume in buoyancy is a volume that's submerged. So that's what this V sub means, the volume submerged. Weight of the object is same as the buoyancy. So if you ever get a question that's like, if you increase the weight of this, what happens to the buoyancy? Weight and buoyancy are proportionally related because buoyancy is just a measure of the weight of that object. It's how much water is being displaced and the upwards force. And if we know that forces are equal and opposite, if you have more weight pushing down, you're gonna have more buoyancy pushing up. This relationship right under buoyancy is important to know if you don't know how to drive the relationships between one another. So just remember that the volume submerged over the total volume is gonna be inversely related to the density of the object, density of fluid. So you can see from this equation here, if the density of the object increases, the volume submerged increases, which makes sense. But if the density of the fluid increases, then the volume submerged decreases. So there's inverse relationships there. This is an important relationship to understand, not necessarily memorize, but just understanding this is good for fluid dynamics. Pascal's law, pressures are equal, flow rate, continuity. Bernoulli's equation, this one is long, but it is very useful. Um, all the different types of pressures and where they can come from and that they're basically going to be congruent at two different points of a um, fluid pathway. Tank with a hole. Now this one <laughs> you don't specifically need to know but I wrote this one down because whenever you're given a problem about a tank it has a hole and it's asking about the velocity of the water that's coming out instead of deriving it through this whole Bernoulli's equation you can just memorize that the velocity of it coming out is going to be the square root of two g times the diameter of the hole. Memorize it if you want. Memorize it if you don't want it. This is going to be here for you. Um, Poiseuille's law. Don't think this one's as high yield, but the important one with this one is to remember that the relationship <clears throat> with the radius is to the fourth power. So a question like this might say, if you double the radius, what would happen to the change in pressure? Here, it's just important to know that radius is to the power four. So it's going to be decreasing the pressure by 16 instead of by four as it would if it's squared. It's normally, radius is normally squared in these equations, but Poiseuille's law, remember it's to the power of four. Normal stress is the same as pressure, force over area, shear stress. They don't get a lot into shear stuff from my experience, um, but shear is just the opposite of normal. Normal is stress going to the parallel and shear is stress going this way, shearing stress. Tensile compressive strain, change in L over L. Shear strain, gamma is X over the initial L. Hooke's law, that's important to know. Hooke's law is basically just introducing E, which is the elastic modulus, and then um, the same thing as G, which is the shear modulus. Um, displacement, again, these aren't super high yield, so I don't know if I would worry about spending too much time hardcore memorizing these. Electromagnetism, a lot of these I've realized that they will give you the equations for these, but understanding these relationships are helpful. Force and electric field, K, Q, Q over R squared. Um, electric field, K, 1, Q over R squared. And in that third equation, you can see the relationship between E field and the force of an electric field. Um, just multiplying it by the charge. Electric potential, change of potential energy. This has to do with the work function and all of that. And then volts is just joules over columns. Yeah, that's pretty much it for electromagnetism. And then we're gonna move over here to circuits. These are important to know. The biggest one is Ohm's law, V equals IR. Resistance, maybe not knowing the exact equation, but knowing the relationships. So knowing that an increase in length will increase resistance and a decrease in area will increase resistance. And then this resi resist resistivity, this row here, that's constant for the wire. So that's important to know. The resistance will change with the length and the diameter, but the resistivity is unique to each material. So that is not going to change with the properties, the length and the diameter and stuff like that. Current I equals Q over T. It's pretty self-explanatory. Current is the charge, movement of charge over time. For things in series, remember in series, resistors add. Capacitors decrease in charge when they're in series. So they're the opposite of resistors. So if you memorize resistors for series and parallel, you can just switch it for capacitors. Define the equivalent capacitance in series or the um, equivalent resistance in series. You could do what I wrote here, which is the product over the sum, or you can do one over the capacitance, add all of those together, and then take the inverse. I don't know if that makes sense, but if you have like um, three, two, four as 
capacitance values, you would do one over three plus one over four plus one over two, and then take that and then inverse it. And that is also the equivalent resistance if you don't wanna do product over sum. These are just other properties of series. Current is always constant in series. Charge is always constant in series. Parallel, voltage is always constant. So if you have two or three, however many parallel wires, voltage drop across those is always going to be consistent. Resistance and capacitance, we just talked about those. It's the opposite for parallel than it is in series. Power equals IV. You can just remember this first part. And then if you remember how to derive the other part, this comes from Ohm's law. So I switched out V with V equals IR, and that's how you get V squared, or that's how you get I squared over R. This is all the root mean squared stuff. Again, this stuff is not super, super high yield. So don't stress over memorizing all the nitty gritty little details of this. Um, capacitance, this is a little bit more important, just knowing that like, for example, a dielectric, adding that dielectric constant K is going to increase the capacitance. It's more about knowing the relationships in exactly the equation itself. Um, potential energy, one half QV, magnetic force, magnetic field, QVB sine theta, that's just something to, important to know. If you've taken physics, you might already know all of that. Charge on a capacitor, all of this stuff. Just knowing the relationships here is really important. Okay, waves and oscillations. This one's a little long. Period and frequency, they are inverses of one another. Hooke's law, um, F equals negative KX. Potential energy of an elastic spring is one half KX squared. I memorized this one because it's very similar to one half MV squared for um, kinetic energy. Elastic potential, which is going to be similar to the work energy theorem that we did in mechanics. All these relationships for springs, basically V max, the frequency and period for springs and pendulums. These are helpful to know, but again, more about the relationships. If you have time, try to memorize all of these. It might come easier to you if you're familiar with these concepts. Down here is talking about the different type of harmonics. So N is gonna be the harmonic number and how that affects each wavelength in frequency. Beat frequency is pretty self-explanatory. It's just the difference between the two frequencies. Intensity, power over area. Intensity level, this relationship is important to know because sometimes they'll ask you if like and a change in intensity of what will equal change in intensity level of like 10 or something or three. And you're just gonna have to know the that it is a log function. So you're gonna have to do think of it in powers of 10 to the power of something. And then that is also multiplied by 10. So this relationship of intensity level is important to know. Doppler effect also, I think they'd probably give you this equation, but important to know how it works, I guess. Okay, we're almost done. Electromagnetism and mirrors. This is kind of similar to what we talked about before. Speed of light, they'll probably give that to you. Three times 10 to the eighth. Photon energy, this one is important. HF, um, where H is a constant that they will give to you most likely. And then frequency is the same as the speed of light over the wavelength. Angle of reflection is gonna be the same as the angle of incidence. The law of refraction, this is talking about when light is refracting into a surface of water. And I have more detailed notes on that one that I can kind of go over. Index of refraction, critical angle, yeah, all of these I have a more drawn out diagram for that I can go over that I think will make more sense if you've never heard of a lot of these mirror stuff. Mirror lens equation, also magnification, lens power, can go over that later, but these are also important to know if you have any questions about any sort of eye diseases or contacts, nearsightedness, farsightedness, all that. This is where all these equations are going to be coming from. Okay, last one is quantum. Again, not very high yield. If you have time and you're feeling confident and you wanna make sure that you know every everything, then yes, definitely go over these. But most of these complex equations they will definitely give to you. Mostly just talking about kinetic energy of electrons and the centripetal force of electrons, stopping voltage, uncertainty of position, all this stuff. They'll have all of these as things you need to memorize in like MCAT workbooks and stuff. But obviously once you start doing like practice problems and stuff, you'll realize that you don't really need to know all of these, mostly just the relationships. But if you're in a physics class, this covers physics one and physics two. So this sheet is very helpful to have, I would say. Um, but yeah, I'd say just get familiar with it. Get familiar with it. I am studying engineering, so I'm pretty comfortable with all of these equations because we use them quite a lot. But I know a lot of people, this is kind of just like completely new and foreign to them. So don't stress. I know this is like a very stressful 
page because there's so much on here but once you really dig into it and go step by step it's not that bad i promise so i will post this whole sheet on the link tree it'll just be under physics and then all physics equations but that is all i have for you in this video